Well in the fourth quarter, the campaign season is already well underway, and we are here to talk about it with Still Shippy, the campaign manager for Governor Mike Parsons' re-election campaign. Thank you for joining us on this week in Missouri Politics. Thanks, Scott. It's a privilege to be here. Let's we'll start off. I mean, when a campaign kicks off, it's good, but this one's kicked off very well. Big kickoff in Bolivar. Tell me about the Bolivar kickoff. You know, it's exciting when Missourians show up. Yeah. Um, we had a campaign event in Bolivar, 1,300 people showed up. It was exciting. You know, there's a lot of energy in the room um, and people from all across the state. I, I arguably will say that this was probably one of the best statewide candidate rollouts in recent history for, for an election. And, um, you know, the governor uh, pitched his vis vision, his mission to the to the voters. and. Um, you know, we had, it was an exciting time. It's a place like Bolivar, you don't, they're not going to forget that, right? Not every day a, cam a governor's campaign kicks off in Bolivar. No, and, and we did it in Bolivar because that's where, you know, the governor, um, you know, kind of started. Uh, yeah. Just down the road in a little town called Wheatland, Missouri, a town mm -hmm. of 350 some people. Um, you know, the governor started there pumping gas, fixing tires, <laughs> changing oil. Um, and then, you know, he was the sheriff of that community. Um, he represented that community and he took those values to Jefferson City and, and those values as governor that he, that he carries today. So let's talk about politics now, the, uh, the quarter, big quarter for a governor, maybe the biggest I've ever seen for, a, for a, an off-year election. Yeah, this is, uh, the, the numbers we were able to report is um, the largest in a non-election year mm -hmm. for, for a gubernatorial candidate. And, um, you know, it just shows that, you know, as we believe that this is a campaign funded by Missourians working for Missouri. And, uh, you know, we're excited about the $3 donations that we're getting and, and um, you know we're going to we're going to keep it's a long haul to uh, next November, 13 months, and um, you know if we can have folks text Parson P A R S O N 48 48 48. It looks, 48. It looks like they are. Now tell me about yourself, Lafayette County guy. Yeah, Missouri, born and raised. Um, grew up in a little town called Odessa, Missouri. Went to school at Mizzou, and uh, my wife is is from St. Louis area, and we live mm -hmm. in Jeff City. So yeah, it's a uh, exciting time to be a Missourian, and, and it's an honor and privilege to work for the governor. It's uh, interesting. That I, I, I know you work for Jay Ashcroft. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought I saw you with Mike Huckabee before. I was. I worked in 2016 on the presidential level. Mm -hmm. I traveled the country with uh, candidate Mike Huckabee, and you know my boss was uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. So uh, I've learned from among the best in the in the in the, in the business. And um, you know it's it's fun to have a network of of people who you can trust, you can lean on, and you know. Uh, those friendships and those connections are invaluable. So let's talk about the case Mike Parsons is going to make to why people should return to the governor's mansion in 2020. You know, the governor is going to run on a case that, you know, he's going to deliver to, you know, make promises and he's keeping the promises, you know, much like President Trump. You know, he went in last year, um, you know, right out of the gate and traveled the state listening to the people of Missouri, um, hearing the concerns directly from, from citizens, local communities, local businesses, uh, local civic organizations about what are the challenges that, you know, this state faces. And it boiled down to two things. And, you know, people will laugh and they, you know, they travel here with the governor. He's always going to point out workforce development and infrastructure. And then what did he I've do? I've heard that from him before, I think. If I yeah, recall. exactly. And what did he do? He went, he, he immediately went to work to get those things done. And after this uh, legislative session, you know, we, we arguably have one of the uh, a nationally recognized workforce development program that's putting people back to work, getting them the skills, the training, uh, and the jobs. To a big part of this, when the economy is good, you, you better make K while the sun shines, right? If you, you better get these jobs and grow Missouri's economy while the while the national economy is growing, because when it starts retracting, the, you don't go get new plants, right? You don't get those factories. If right. you're not prepared for the good times, you won't take advantage of them. Yeah, and the governor's just as excited about the large job announcements as he as he is the you know the small community mainstream jobs. That are adding two, three, four, five, ten people, and uh, th those mean things because you know the governor's, <clears throat> you know, cut taxes, put people back to work. We've created um, you know over forty thousand jobs. Wages are on the rise. Um, there are so many good things, and Missourians believe that you know we're on the right track. The governor is and the leader uh, in the seat driving that, and we're on the right track, and and we're going to take that case to the voters. I've seen some Republicans start to tie Nicole Gallo with National Democrats, say she's extreme. Can you really make the case Nicole Galloway is an extremist Democrat? Look, I, I think that Missouri Democrats, um, as as a party, are going to have a a very hard time selling their message to Missouri voters. Um, National Democrats, when you talk about abolishing ICE, free college health care for illegal immigrants, um, you know the the litany, the, the litmus test for the Democrats does not sit well with whether you're you know in the urban cities of St. Louis or Kansas City, mm -hmm. Columbia, or outstate, the Boot Heel, Northwest Missouri. Um, you know, the governor's, you know, outworking, uh, you know, our campaign slogan is works for Missouri. Um, the, the governor's- The is there's going to be some folks that try to not let her escape that national message. 
Yeah, you could probably say that. <laughs> you could probably say that. Um, just as much as somebody's, uh, you know, probably going to force us to, to answer questions about Let's talk things. about Donald Trump. There was a, a tweet that got posted by the president not long after the governor's announcement of supporting him. That's got to that's got to make you feel good when the president of the United States supports your campaign. But does it make you a little nervous? And, and how's Trump run right now in places like, let's say, West St. Louis County or, or, or Southern Clay County? Places where you have some suburban folks that are in other parts of the nation he hasn't run that well in and in the midterms. Where's Trump at now? Does it make you a little nervous being tied to Trump? You know, we, we hear that message, um, but at the same time, we are proud to receive the endorsement. The governor's proud to receive the endorsement of uh, President Trump. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's going to boil down to how does this affect your family? Does your family have more opportunity, greater freedom, uh, lower taxes, better job environment, better schools, safer streets, those types of things. And, you know, Republicans, the president is providing that. He's providing real results. The governor is working hard to do that as well. And, you know, I, I think that uh, at the end of the day, people are going to see through that, maybe see through the tweets and uh, put that aside and say, yeah. Well, it looks to me like the, the tweets take that. Well, it might hurt you in places like Afton or Webster Grove, Chesterfield. It does seem like people in Jefferson County love it. It does seem like people in Eastern Jackson County. He does better than a Republican normally should. I, I wonder if those margins have stayed the same. He's, he's attacked the media. I don't think the media is more popular than it was four years ago. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, the, you're going to see the you're going to see the governor travel the state. Um, you know, and and you know champion issues that matter to the voters. He's going to keep working hard um, to you know, address the, the real issues of, of everyday Missourians. And I don't think that the message that the Missouri Democrat Party has is going to accomplish that. Let's talk about it. Let's, get, let's take a little campaign, a little politics. Yeah. When you, in Missouri right now, obviously no one would think Trump could replicate a 19-point win. I mean, that was historic. It, 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 it almost unfathomable to do that well. But when you start off, let's say you're just blank Republican, blank Democrat. Is it a Republican advantage, maybe five points in Missouri now? Is it six points? I've seen it. I've seen some folks say Missouri started out with a seven-point advantage for Republican. Where do you think that number is just blank candidates? Uh, I'd probably say you know a plus six to plus eight. But then mm -hmm. again, you know, polling is polling, right? Sure. Um, you know, I, we talk to a lot of people that say, who are those polls actually talking to? Um, because I've never received a poll. I've never gotten a phone call. And so, um, you know, yes, while we do polling, uh, at the same time, the governor's hitting the streets, and um, you know, we're you know, pounding the pavement and talking to voters directly. So that, that somewhere six to eight is like the down ballot races that maybe don't get as much attention. Those races are about, a, that's where the advantage kind of comes into a little bit more when the top of the ticket does well, maybe a little bit south of six when they don't. That advantage is a very, it's changed a lot over the course of history of Missouri to where that the Republicans had that deficit, maybe even more than that back in the day. Yeah, and I think that that all goes back to, you know, Missouri, the Missouri Republicans, the leadership in the Republican Party, listening to the people of Missouri. Uh, I don't think the people of Missouri have changed. Uh, it's just a matter of do you know which party which party is um, you know directly representing the values of Missourians, and I, I think that uh, the Missouri Democratic Party has overplayed their hand on a number of issues, and the voters are fed up, and they don't they don't want it anymore. We hope that you'll come back and share your views in the next 13 months as this campaign unfolds. Yeah, it's going to be an exciting time, and thanks for the thanks for the opportunity to join the show and, and uh, tell the folks about uh, the Governor Parsons' leadership, and um, we'll be around. Thanks for joining us. For the rest of this interview, go to TWMP.com. We're going to finish talking politics with Steele. Right back with our Opinion Maker panel. And yes, there will be a baseball show after this. All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good-paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. Welcome back to this week in Missouri Politics. Opinion maker panel time. David Barkley is always very well prepared. Dean of the Missouri Republican Party. Welcome back, sir. Yeah, but he's got more notes between his legs than I've ever had in my notebook. 
David Gregory, I think that means rising star of the Missouri Republican Party. Welcome back, sir. Thanks so much for having me. Tracy McGreary, friend of the show here in St. Louis <laughs> County, Representative. Let's talk about Nicole Galloway. Impressive fundraising quarter, right? Great quarter. Yeah, she raised over a million dollars in this last quarter, and I think it really shows that she has the support of average, everyday working Missouri families, and I think she's off to a great start. I think it's interesting. I mean, the, the first question you'd ask when you're running as an incumbent, however they became the incumbent, is you're going to have the money to really make this a real race. Outside of the DG and other things, it looks like Nicole Galloway will have will have the ability to run a full race. Maybe not outraise the governor, but run a full race. Exactly. And, you know, for a lot of Democratic candidates, we don't always have to have the most money to win, but we have to have enough money to win. And Auditor Galloway will have enough money to win the governor's race. David Barkley, she said that shows the support of everyday working families. Is that what that report showed to you? <laughs> no. I, I, or Missouri it, families. Look, the, the, the Democrats are, are far advanced to the Republicans in regards to Internet fundraising and into mm -hmm. their national database. And, and it, it is a great asset. And so to that extent, yes. Yes. Is it a reflection of strength? No. In fact, the polling that I just got showed that the governor is now up over 15 points. So well, it uh, was a good good quarter, right? Even yeah. if the money that came from places that might not be Missouri, it was a good quarter. Right. And, and look, the, the governor out, uh, outraised her, you know, uh, three to one on the big dollars. 1.5 million, almost two million dollars this full quarter. True. And so it's those, it's all the dollars net that you spend at the end of the, end of the day that makes a difference. But the bottom line is the governor continues to overperform among Democrats, blacks, women, moderates, all those categories, rural, uh, rural urban, et cetera. And we're and seeing that stretch the pack, right? Yes. David Gregory, it was a good quarter for Lico Galloway. I think maybe the person, I mean, the governor raised the most money ever for a non-election year quarter. That yeah. would be the expectation, but so did she. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I'll tell you what, in the most recent polling, as, uh, as Mr. Barkley just mentioned, the governor's... Uh, polling more favorably than Donald Trump. Donald Trump's up at least 10 points in the state of Missouri. That's a very good thing for the governor. But the other excellent thing for the governor is, uh, is his newest lead campaign manager, Steele Shippey. Steele yeah. Shippey has a tremendous work ethic. He's an absolute machine and he doesn't know how to fail. Moving Steele Shippey to the campaign side back in July was a great move for the governor. It's exactly what he needed to do to maintain his position in 2020. Yeah. I agree. I mean, look, an impressive guy. It was interesting to interview him and kind of getting the nuts and bolts of some of the campaign stuff. Some of that stuff's going to be on the web, but he really, I mean, there was a professional face on that, on that campaign, I think, no question. Right, exactly. So, um, you know, I... Polls, who knows about polls, we're more than a year out at this point, but I, I do want to emphasize that um, Auditor Galloway's support and donations also are coming from Missouri. 94% of her donations were from Missouri, and so it's not like she's getting money in from the DNC. Um, she's raising money from Missourians. Let's talk about something that is happening in Washington, D.C., not just the playoffs, but uh, the impeachment of Donald Trump. That has to be the type of thing. I, I don't know that impeaching a president with months left in his term makes a lot of common sense to people. I'm not sure that does much more than fire up Republicans. Is there a political benefit to, to impeaching the president in an election year? I don't know. I mean, I'm I, maybe I'm um, showing my moderate roots here, but I think this is a time, this impeachment issue is a time for the hyper-partisanship on yes. both sides to just calm down. We Is it possible, though? Well, I think that there are enough moderates out there that we should try to use our voice to get people to, at the very least, let this process work out. And let's not make it political. Let's not make it, you know, let's try to remove the fringe on both sides and just let the process work out. Our founding fathers wanted this process to work, and I think we should let it work out. David Gregory, can you possibly remove the hyper-partisanship from an impeachment in an election year? No, you can't. But the biggest problem with the impeachment inquiry is the real motivation behind it. The real motivation is not the Constitution. It's a political agenda, and that's a problem. I think Congress needs to stop wasting their time on these politically motivated agendas, and they need to start spending time and focusing on things like, oh, I don't know, cutting spending and securing our borders, doing the things they were elected to do. Are you saying build the wall? <laughs> build the wall. <laughs> David Barnes, I just it just feels like to me that I understand that, that Donald Trump engenders great love. Look, my father, I, I would hate to have to have him pick between me and Donald Trump. He's from rural Missouri. He's a, we know he's how an older white guy. It would not right. go well for me. <laughs> but I also know that there's people in the cities that are very that, that he engenders very deep hatred amongst. Mm -hmm. I, I just this looks like the type of thing that fires up Republicans. Look, I, uh, our polling is showing incredible intensity this early on in a cycle. Did you see it before the impeachment? Though? I think the impeachment's energized that. Oh, no, it's like Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh, yeah. we, Democrats were outperforming Republicans in terms of intensity in mm -hmm. 2018. Which they should, by, right? by almost 24 points in early September. By mid-October, it was dead even, and by Election Day, 
of very conservative voters. We're at 89 percent, which is almost unheard of in an off election year. Let me ask you a question, though. When, when they impeached Bill Clinton, for I think history has said probably not, wasn't a good decision at the time. Terrible. If you look at Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton knew how to bite his lip and say, I feel your pain and play the sympathy card. And you almost felt bad for him being picked on by some people motivated by partisanship. Heck, can you possibly, even your supporters, feel sympathy for Donald Trump? We'll even try that. It's a different dynamic. I mean, you know, look, okay. there there are cycles you can use humor and it hits. There are cycles you have to be serious. Mm -hmm. We're in a different sort of age, and, and this is a combative age. The fact that the House is, is creating this hyper part, I mean, you, you don't bring an impeachment the last year of a, of a president. Yeah. You just don't do it. And it didn't bode well for the Republicans. I didn't support that. I mean, Clinton was doing centrist policies, welfare reform, signed the mm -hmm. balanced budget bill, things like that. And the, they overstepped. This is an overstep. I think it's going to turn into another Kavanaugh moment, and it could be disastrous for their party. And and they're delaying the the debate is still out there among you know are we going to have socialist, communist, or far left Democrats running for president? That's a problem that Nicole has. Is you know the energy in St. Louis is among progressives, and in Kansas City among progressives, but outstate Democrats it's alien to. So that is the problem all the way down the line what this election presents. If the Democrats continue, they're gonna delay everything until late, a hyper-partisan, Kavanaugh kind of deal, which I don't think bodes well for not only them, but I think it's gonna kill their downstate tickets across the country. If you're, a, if you're a Democrat in Missouri, I think that there's a case to be made. You could impeach Donald Trump if the Senate just doesn't do anything with it. It excites your base in certain parts of the country, and you win a national election even making that maybe political mistake. However, in Missouri, it just doesn't do you any favors at all if you're a Missouri Democrat. Is that not the pull we're seeing right now between Missouri Democrats and National Democrats? They can get where they want to go without Missouri. Well, it, it's not about that. It, you, we have to be respectful of the process. And in all due respect, the Founding Fathers didn't say unless, you know, we, we've got this co-equal branch of government, except if it's real close to election and then the Constitution doesn't apply. So I think that... Uh, the president has pushed and pushed and pushed the edge of things that are borderline illegal, unethical, and unconstitutional. And just because we're getting close to an election, I think it's the um, the House of Representatives' duty to at least act as a role of prosecutor and gather information. Except let me, his policies, for example, on immigration, which are being called out at, with her, her, her outrageous terms and everything else, mere, in fact, probably aren't even as strong as Obama or Clinton. And, and the same thing, the Biden standard in 16 is no longer the standard for, for Trump. So I think it's more his personality is driven. I think the, the actual facts of the issues, if people were to look at that, it's completely unfair. They're tagging Donald Trump because of his of who he is, not what he's done. David, I, you know, you're on the doorstep. It's always been a, a conundrum to me. Donald Trump campaigned on ex the most extremely aggressive immigration policies that I've ever heard anybody say out loud. You go to the doorstep. You say, I'm going to be pro-life. I'm going to cut taxes. When you go to Jeff City, you do it, and people are shocked. It's a little bit like, well, Donald Trump campaigned on this and won a national election based on those policies. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of support. I can tell you door-to-door, -door, especially in my district, there's an absolute, absolute tremendous amount of support for the, for the president. Uh, I, I have... No concern that he's going to win Missouri next year. Yeah, but you got 34,000 despicables, despicables in your district. Oh, so. the de undesirables. <laughs> Give me a prediction. Do, do the, does the House of Representatives actually impeach President Trump? Uh, I, I think there's a fair chance they will, yes. Give me the odds. 50-50? I, I say 60-40. Wow. Do, do you think they actually impeach President Trump? Uh, I think the House could impeach him, but the Senate will never convict him. It's Agreed. a complete waste of time. Do, do they actually do this? I uh, agree with the first part of what the representative said. The House will impeach, but it, it's not going to happen in the Senate. If you're a Republican, is that good news for you? Uh, I, I think it is a massive overreach. It's a Kavanaugh moment. It's a Clinton moment. The history is on our side, and it's an overreach because of the facts. Is uh, in the district, there's an adjoining district here that has a special election coming up right. in November. It, it felt to me like the Democrats had a very good chance to win that. Um, and they may still, it's going to be very competitive. But I would say if you're a Republican in that district, that probably helps the Republican, right? Yeah, it's going to ignite the base. It's going to motivate. It's going to turn out. That's exactly right. If you're, um, if you're sitting back and you're, you watch what the, happened to the Republicans after the Clinton, will there be a worse verdict for Democrats nationally than was for Republicans for impeaching Clinton? Well, I think, you know, Missouri is a long way from Washington, D.C., and we still, although, you know, I appreciate this topic t on the show, we still, there are things that are very Missouri-specific that we need to get focused back on. Give me your back cards on. prediction. They're going to sweep. Cards prediction. Oh, we're going to win the World Series. World Series? Sweep and win. Sweep and win. World Series. Uh, you're going you're gonna to hear it next on the baseball show. I predicted cards in six. Uh, Eric Schmidt predicted cards in seven. We'll be right back with our baseball show after this.
At Ameren, Missouri, we know what light can do. It draws people together and chases monsters away. And if you shine it in the right direction, it will light the path for the next generation, showing them what their tomorrow could look like and spotlighting the possibilities that lay in front of them. Investing in our community by lighting the way forward. That's energy at work. Ameren, Missouri. Welcome back. This week of Missouri Politics, but as you can see, it's turning into the baseball show. I told you I hope we'd be back here this week, and we were. Eric Schmidt, welcome back. The smile is real. I love it. I love this time of year. The NLDS, you got to tell, who was the MVP of the NLDS, the five-game beatdown of the Braves? Well, I think you'd have to go with Yachty, right? Because if you look at that, oh, yeah. if you look at that series, the emotional swing that took place in 24 hours between Sunday and Monday, between Game 3 and Game 4, when we had the lead, a slim lead, the Martinez blows the save, then we come back, we're down in game four, Yachty gets those two RBIs late in the game, he gets the RBI late in the game, and then the sack fly, good situational hitting to win the game, and then all of a sudden you roll into game five and it was a, it was a laugher, it was nice. People sometimes ask me, what's your favorite game to watch ever? It, to me, that was the game because 10 runs unprecedented, but wow. you could just enjoy the game, right? You could enjoy the game for the rest of the game. It was a lot of fun. I had a headache until <laughs> the first inning. Then it slowly went away as the first inning happened. I'm going to say Mike Schilt. Strong German leadership. It works every time. He wasn't rattled. We lost it with that, the game Sunday. We could have fell apart. Comes back. Tough game Monday. I'd like to think the crowd helped with that one. And then we come in game five and down. Now i got to say manager Mike Schilt during Oktoberfest was the MVP. <laughs> Let me say the biggest moment. I think you, cut, you covered it with Yachty, right? Yeah, I think, um, you know, that game uh, was uh, so pivotal because you're facing elimination, right, with, uh, was, you know, it's the eighth inning. It's the bottom of the eighth, and Yachty does doesn't do too much. Now, his numbers overall for the series weren't spectacular. Marcelo Zuna, Paul Goldschmidt, yep. those guys really, really came through. Um, you could probably get, you know, more guys on base in front of those guys in the series if you had to critique anything. Yes. But they had a good series. But I think it's in those key moments. We've seen Yachty now since 2004. In those key moments, champion. the man rises to the occasion. And it couldn't have been a bigger moment with the season on the line in game four late in the game. And he, he came through. And how many times have we talked about, you know, the Cardinals haven't been great with runners in scoring position? Well, there they are, man on third, one out. And first pitch, Yachty always looks for that first pitch fastball. Yep. He did it in that eighth inning RBI. He did it in extra innings, and they win the game. 20th in LCS. You got to give me your prediction. Looking at the series, let's talk about the key matchups of this series going into the Washington Nationals. Well, I think you look at uh, the Cardinals, for example, um, have the best ERA um, if you look at their entire staff in the National League. The Washington Nationals uh, were the best in the National League with runners in scoring position. So, you know, I know we'll talk probably about um, starting pitching, but I think once you get later into the game, um, the bullpens and how they match up against those lineups, the Cardinals definitely have an advantage with their bullpen. It, I think these teams are very evenly matched. They really are. Uh, Washington has a lot of momentum, so do the Cardinals. But I think you get later in that game, the Cardinals' bullpen has been a strength for them all year. Schilt's strength, I think biggest strength as a manager, is managing that bullpen. The Nationals have begun with runners in scoring position. So how do those matchups work out principally? When do you bring in uh, Miller, right? He's going to face uh, Soto several times, maybe every game at some point in the game. So those key matchups along the way, our bullpen, there are three, four, five guys, that's going to be the matchup. Because these, you know, in these games, um, time is I got to say, though, if you don't score any runs, it doesn't matter how well your bullpen yeah. pitches. We saw that against Atlanta. If the lineup just takes days off sometimes, it doesn't show up. Credit the other side's pitching, but when it happens so often, I think that it's just cumulative. Does the lineup show up one day? And let's talk about the rotation. So game one, you, you're not seeing Scherzer. You're not seeing Strasburg. We're going to throw out Michaelis. We're going to save Wainwright for game two. I think that's really great because then he can come back that's in right. game five at home. You want him at home. Then Flaherty, the stud, pitches three and seven, and Hudson at four. I like it because game one is huge. Mike, if Michaelis can show up and win game one, tonight, then I think the whole series tone is set. you got to win the games you're not facing Scherzer and Strasburg, right? I think that's right. They'll, they're going to have Scherzer and Strasburg in four of those games. Um, but if you ask me, you will have Michaelis for two, Wainwright for two, potentially, and uh, Flaherty for two. And the key is, the way uh, you mentioned it, the way Schilt has set up that rotation, mm -hmm. You know, there's some debate. You have Michaelis or Wainwright in game one or two. He set it up perfectly because you want Wainwright at home yes. in game six, right? You want Wainwright at home in game the six. The Cardinals have to win the three games they don't start, right? 
Uh, I think so, but you know, postseason's crazy, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you think of how well Flaherty pitched in, in game two of that series, and we lost that game, and then, of course, then he comes back, and uh, again, it wasn't, but he pitched a good game. The math gets very hard if they need to, if they, if the Nationals take game one, and they have to win three or four starts by Scherzer and Strasburg. But let me throw out something, a statistic, too. In the for NLDS, the Washington starters, because of the uh, their bullpen has been stressed, it's been challenged, using those starters in the bullpen, yes. the starters pitch 67% of the innings. In the regular season, it was about 40%. So the, in the NLDS, the Nationals really spent their starting pitchers, not just when they were starting, and but Strasburg out of the bullpen. Strasburg has a history of injury. Right, and so it, uh, the longer this series goes, the deeper you get into games, I think the depth of the Cardinals bullpen will be a big advantage in this series. Well, let's talk about X-Factors. You called Tommy Ebbin that came out to look very good through the NLDS. Who's the X factor in the NLCS, the 20th NLCS for the Cardinals? Yeah, and, and by the way, 10th NLCS in the last 20 years. I mean, you talk about the crown jewel, the National League, that is the Cardinals. And, um, and can we, is it possible to get a Daniel Descalzo, Pete Cosma first game pitch throw out? I mean, <laughs> those guys, I was going to say they were the key matchups, but they were the key matchups at one time to bury the Nationals. I think maybe karma for the Nationals. They just don't win in the playoffs. Yeah, well, they kind of got over that hump in that NLDS Hopefully against a very not. good Dodgers team. Who's going to sink them this time is the X factor. I think Colton Wong. So, if you look at this lineup, if you know that game five, if that's any, they're not going to score ten runs in the first inning every game. But you started to see. Probably. Look, their game plan was better plate discipline. They laid off that slider away out of the strike zone. If they carry that approach, and Sanchez in game one, by the way, throws a lot of changeups. And if they're not chasing, that's a good recipe for success for the Cardinals. But I think Tommy Edmonds going to be a big factor. I don't want to pick him twice. But Colton Wong at the top of that lineup, which I think is where he'll be, um, or even if he's at the bottom of the lineup, setting up the top of the order once they roll that lineup. Um, he's such a threat. He looks healthy. He's got speed. He plays great defense. And if they get some guys on base for Goldschmidt and Ozuna, uh, I think this, this team can really take off offensively. And their pitching has been consistent. There's a lot of crazy things that happen in the playoffs, but you look at the consistency, the starting pitching and bullpen, it's a real strength. I'll give you an X factor is Carlos Martinez. If Carlos Martinez stuff is nasty in the strike zone, then I think the Cardinals have every chance to win this series. If Carlos Martinez comes in and starts walking guys and you can't trust him, I don't know who steps up and close. If you, if you Miller up, who pitches there? I think Carlos Martinez and Kenny throw strikes is probably the X factor of the series. Well, he's the closer, and so get, get your thumbs ready. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but I do think Schilt, he's going to have these key, Gallegos, Miller, he's going to have. And, uh, the ninth inning in a playoff game is different. It uh, totally is, but I, I mean, think that you can. he'll manage that bullpen well. But there's no question, if there's a tight lead for the Cardinals in the ninth, Carlos Martinez is coming in, so we'll see how he does. Maybe David Fries can coach him. Last predictions, uh, how does this Series end. I think this is a this is a well this is a good matchup. Um, they're uh, they're both good teams that are rolling in now. I'm not sure nationally people thought they they would both be here, but I think this this goes seven. I think the Cardinals win in seven with Flaherty on the mound at, at Bush. I'd like to say it's the Cardinals in six, but um, look, they have a deep lineup. We have good pitching. I think they're going to they're going to trade blows back and forth, and the Cardinals win in seven. I think the Cardinals win in six. The city that brought you Richard Nixon, Monica Lewinsky, Jefferson Davis, I think sinks. There's a there's a choking mentality to the swamp, and I think it chokes the Nationals. Let's drain the swamp. Yes, let's. Uh, we're going to come right back. We'll be right back. We knew we'd be here, but TWMP. A couple more topics. Go to TWMP.com. We're going to talk. Finish talking about this series. Maybe look ahead to the World Series. We'll be right back after this, and we'll see you next week on this week in Missouri politics. Politics, sponsored by the Missouri Association of Career Fire Protection Districts, Spire, and Sterling Bank. <laughs> 